Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Unleashing Deepin podcast. My name is Tyler. I am your host, and I am really excited about this next guest, uh, someone that I can say I've started to become a friend with over the last few weeks. If you don't know who our guest is, uh, there's a pretty high degree of certainty that uh, you have used something from the advancements that he's done in the field. So I'm really excited to have Jeff Pulver on the podcast. Uh, Jeff, welcome to the pod. Um, thanks for having me. Well, I'd love to maybe start for people who don't know, if you could just share a little bit about your background. You've definitely been a ginormous pioneer in the telecom space, specifically with voice over IP. So if you could just share a bit of your background for folks, I think that'd be a great place to start. I, I think the most important part about my background is for people to understand that anything is, anything is possible, that if you allow yourself the possibility of achieving a goal, you can get there. Uh, my own particular background started out, you know, not, I had no telecom background whatsoever when I was doing very, uh, very pioneering work in the early days of what's now known as uh, uh, the internet telecom industry. I, I came at it from a, being an amateur radio operator and uh, understanding the need and the desires for people to, to communicate. And so when I started experimenting and doing things, whether there was someone around to tell me I couldn't do it, I don't know. I was ignorant of those people, and I just proceeded to do it. And so, yeah. So, if anyone listening to this podcast has ever, in the past, you know, since the, in the last twenty years, have they ever spoken to somebody using, I don't know, we'll go from Skype to WhatsApp to Messenger to Signal to Telegram to uh, Instagram, or maybe they've maybe they've been on the other side of a Zoom or a T or a Google Team or dial pad where where they were just you know they were part of the conversation if they haven't paid any money to participate collectively you're welcome because um that is something i did do in fact not only did i help move the entire industry to help move the entire telecom industry into the uh world of uh packet-based voice communication through some work that i did a uh, ruling that I brought forth to the FCC 21 years ago for consideration, which got passed in February of 2004, literally helped change the way the world communicates because I was very much worried about maintaining a greenfield opportunity. You see a lot of green around me. It could be St. Patty's Day by you, perhaps, but it's it also represents opportunities where you can grow from. And I... Back in 2003, at least, you know, I was worried that the telecom companies wanted to have a new frontier just for themselves, which case back in the, back then would, would have been broadband. And I wanted to protect broadband for up and coming entrepreneurs, people who wanted to make a difference, who wanted to just do things differently. And there was a lot of conversation that, as, as it was said, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And I said, mm -mm, not necessarily. Sometimes it could be something else. You just never know. Uh, and in, in our particular case, I'm very grateful that, uh, I had the help of uh, my friend, Glenn Richards, um, who was a telecom attorney and he and his team drafted, uh, some ideas, which we went back and forth on for weeks. And again, I don't have a background in telecom law. I'm not a telecom attorney, but we went back and forth and we filed some paperwork at the federal communications commission in February, in February of 2003. And voila, after many trips to Washington meeting with many different interesting people, on February 12th, 2004, something known as the Pulver Order was, was passed, and I'm the Pulver of the Pulver Order. I became a subject noun in Washington, and you can look all this stuff up, and if you happen to have any friends that are telecom attorneys, they may have studied this in law school, depending upon when they graduated, which is really odd. And if you happen to be going to Stanford Business School, you could actually look up uh, me, uh, there's a case study that I was introduced with uh, in March of 2000, in uh, March of November 2004, all about all this. And uh, again, I didn't set forth to become a case study at Stanford. I didn't set forth to do anything other than follow something intuitively I thought was right. And um, while I was doing all this, I also started a company which became known as Vonage, which was the first successful broadband communications company. Uh, if any of you are gamers and you think play things like Fortnite, you're welcome for that too, because VVox, which is a voice engine of Fortnite, I started that company. VVox was uh, also the company that added voice to Second Life and provided voice to a lot of games created by Sony Online Entertainment and EA Software and many others. And and again, you know, I've done other things too in the world of astronomy and in music and 
you know, I, I, I'm someone who believes you could be passionate about many things and be great at many things. You don't have to be put in one spot. And um, I happen also to be a big fan now of uh, what uh, what Tyler will refer to as D-Pin. I refer to as D-Von because uh, back in 1995, I didn't, defi- I didn't define the term pin for anything, but I de- did define Von to be voice on the net and video on the net. And what I'm looking at these days is decentralized networks, particularly how do we take value, how do we create value in the decentralization and how does blockchain play a role in that? And how do all of us benefit? And so, uh, you know, Vonage, in my opinion, humble opinion, is one of the best examples of being a broadband parasite. Because let's face it, Vonage did not pay a penny for any of the fiber that it runs on. It doesn't pay, it never paid any money for its customers' Wi-Fi networks or the Wi-Fi connectivity that it depended upon. Yet, it leveraged all of it to create billions of dollars of value for its shareholders. Now, you think about that. Now, what if you are now in this business of communications and you want to decentralize certain elements and certain aspects to that. Well, you can. Right. And um, so I've seen all this. So in terms of my background, I'm someone who believes in the impossible. I believe that nothing is impossible if you believe in it, particularly if you allow yourself the possibility of letting your magic fly. Yeah, uh, it's incredible. And when I first heard your story, it was one of those things where you know it's hard to kind of connect the dots uh, until you start realizing that there was all these monumental achievements, whether it was on the technical or on the regulatory side, that's enabled what we're all getting excited about today, which is sort of this proliferation of decentralized wireless, physical infrastructure. Uh, and so you're sort of colloquially known as the father of VoIP. For, for listeners to help kind of level set the story a bit, can you talk about what communications, telecommunications specifically was like back when you were getting started and, and sort of what drove you to want to initially do phone calls on the internet? Well, when I first got started was, you know, as a consumer a very long time ago, as a kid growing up, there's something called long distance where growing up in New York city, if I called from Queens to Manhattan, it was actually a, uh, not a free phone call. If I called someone in Queens, I don't think we paid much, but I've called someone just a borrow away. It was money. Forget about calling New Jersey or calling California. That was far away. And if you called someone internationally, forget about it. It was dollars per minute. And um, what, one thing I discovered as an amateur radio operator growing up is that if I had friends in the Caribbean, maybe they're in Puerto Rico, maybe they're in a, a Dominican Republic, or maybe they're sitting someplace in, in, in another play, in another location, if they had family in New York City, I would find ways to patch them from the radio over the telephone so they, they could, now of course everyone could listen to the conversations, but they were not commercial in nature, and they could talk for free. And I was very much intrigued by that whole idea of interconnecting telephones and radio. And uh, 20 years later, there was a company called Vocal Tech, which um, brought forth something called, it, w- w- the product name was Internet Phone, but we called it iPhone. And so back in 95, uh, the first iPhone that I know about did not come from Silicon Valley at all. It came from a small company based in Herzliya, and they had the iPhone. And and we spoke on the computer, you know, uh, very innocently, in fact, talking to people from all over the world. And and that got me, gave me an idea. And that led to creating something called the original free world, free world dial-up. It was free. It connected the world and ran a dial-up. But what I did is I used some software to um, create a, a network where people could uh, provide dial-in and dial-out capabilities from their personal computers. And I didn't do that to make money. I didn't do that to uh, to, to offer free calls because no one made any money in that. That was the thing. If you wanted to participate, you could. And if you wanted to contribute, you could. Uh, but there, it was de- that was totally decentralized. I mean, literally. It was every node was run by a person I did have what I called the GSN, the Global Server Network, which was a way of understanding, okay, what nodes are running right now. But the rest of it was up to the the users. And this is 1995. And so mm-hmm. back then we had personal computers. I mean, what's sitting inside my iPhone today as far as a phone, I mean, that's a computer. That's a very powerful computer compared to the uh, stuff, the, the door knob, the doorway, the, the, the stuff which we, I used back then. Right. Um, and, and, and back in even 20 years ago, you know, we still had, uh, wasn't free phone calling at all. We're still paying pennies per minute, sometimes many pennies per minute to call, uh, to call 
overseas and we were calling and we were paying pennies per minute to call internationally and uh we certainly didn't have a uh, high quality we didn't have uh there used to be commercials from a company where it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop and we had things like music on hold but the reality was the comp the codex the compression decompression technology did not actually let you hear a pin drop nor could you actually play music on hold because it got knocked out by the frequency response of the codex but what we had was an environment um, ready for things, uh, put things in different contexts. Back in 95, when I got started, great real-time video on the internet was using something called CUCME, and you had a 160 by 120 uh, uh, black and white image getting five to seven frames per second, and that was considered high fidelity. That was amazing qualities back then, and it slowly grew to the technicolor that we have today, but it took a lot of time. And those environments, you know, there was a lot of pioneering work, you know, hundreds of millions of hours of engineering was done by many people, not by me, but by many other people to get the tech, the real-time transport technologies working, to get the compression technologies working, to create standards which worked across the world. And um, I did help promote all that. I helped, I also created a conference series called the Vaughn Events, which became the trade show, the, 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 the event trade show um business which i ran in the united states and, and in europe and other places around the world and that helped bring together a global community of change uh, both from an entrepreneurial perspective as well as from a telecom perspective because they got people got to see change happening in real time i remember the cto of at&t and i we were on a panel in 1997 and he basically looked at me and he said jeff look internet telephony is interesting but we don't play with toys at at&t and two years later, he was at my conference writing a multi-million dollar contract to buy product from one of our customers. Like, okay, fine, change happens. And so so I was there at the forefront of this opportunity and I, I got involved in the early days with regulatory policy by simply sharing opinion of the effects of internet telephony on telecom as if I knew something. Again, I had no telecom background at all, but people were asking me my opinion I don't know if you've ever read the book or saw the movie Secret Life of Secret Life of Walter Mitty, but you know I was totally a fish out of water, saying things being interpreted to mean something else. Ultimately, yes, I do have a clue now how this stuff works, but I didn't then. But I, I did see the opportunity to connect the world, and I have a desire to cross connect and and build networks, physical networks, people networks, and and a chance for people to dream and to dream big. And so. Um, you know, it's it's really about about what you do with this stuff, right? We we have the opportunity, and then it's like, um, what do you do? So, internet telephony was getting a bad rap from incumbent phone companies, who went to the government for support to say, hey, wait a second, these people are not playing by our rules; they have to, and it's just not fair. So, at my conferences, I used to invite regulators to my events to meet the entrepreneurs. So that they didn't understand that the lobbyists were throwing them a line, but in in reality, it was a very nascent industry, and and the uh, the regulators when they came got to see firsthand the state of the art, and over time we were able to help build up relationships and 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 ultimately it, it became the telecom industry, but it didn't happen overnight, and I was very I'm very happy to have had a seat at the table while it did transform. Yeah. No, it's quite amazing. Like I said, when you, you look back, you start to take for granted these these messaging apps using real-time communication. And had it not been for the Pulver order, this was kind of news to me as I began to get to know you, that wouldn't be the case. And it's pretty exciting. What, one of the other aspects of, of the Pulver order that I think is kind of interesting is that it's called, like as you mentioned, a lot of these these regulators that when they go and they create these policies, it's usually lobbied by trade organizations but you were an individual. Can you talk to why it's called the Pulver Order? And then maybe just share a bit of other details as to how impactful that was for today. Well, well, well I have to say this. It took 20 years to find the answer to your question. If you, if you would have asked me prior to February 12th, 2024, I would not know why it was called the, the, the uh, Pulver Order because Free Will Dial-Up in 1995 was a project. It wasn't a company. It was just an effort by a bunch of people volunteering around the world to, 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 to play, to have fun. And that, that version of free will dial up uh, offered free phone calling. It wasn't like uh, secretly hidden charges. That was free. Over seven years, FWD or free will dial up evolved into being a company, which I did fund. 
and it ended up doing end-to-end -end IP. In other words, what we're doing right now, where how you and I are going computer to computer, we're, we're, we're using the internet to communicate, but we're not going over the telephone network. We're just going endpoint to endpoint. So that's what end-to-end -end IP was. 21 years ago, a lot of people had no idea what I was talking about when I wanted to protect end-to-end -end IP, that I thought it was different than phone calls. The lobbyists were saying, well, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Because there were things like IP phones where internet-based IP, it looks like a regular phone these days because almost all phones are IP-based now. But back then it's like, well, it looks like a phone, it must be a phone. But it really, it was radically different. And so um, the company called Free World Dial-Up filed a petition uh, to ask for regulatory clarity because I felt I, like I needed standing. So I needed, I had that company which got the attention. But what stood out was it was Free World Dial-Up and it was Jeff Pulver. And so one of the people from the FCC, we had a, we had, we, I had an event on February 12th at the National Press Club and three of the people that were literally in the deliberation to decide whether or not this should be passed or the, even voted upon were in the room. And they said that uh, ultimately it was the, the FCC was, was used to trade associations and large corporations coming in and asking for a special treatment or asking for consideration. Never before did a person just show up and say, hey, hi, I'm Jeff, and I would like to have regulatory clarity that voice communication that originates on the internet should not be regulated as telex. I'm like, what? And and then one of the other people said, well, you know, FWD doesn't roll over, the, or free world dial-up doesn't really roll over, roll off your lips so easily, but Pulver does. So when it was decided to be in order, um, and I realized I became a subject down in D.C. when Chairman Michael Powell, in announcing the passing of this order, he referenced Pulver about 80 times in his speech. And I realized ultimately he wasn't talking about me. He was talking about the order. <clears throat> and for the very first time, I realized what's it like to be a subject noun. And so I've been, since I've been, a, I've been celebrating being a subject noun in Washington for 20 plus years. And I can tell you that the passing of the Pulver order transformed telecom. That is to say, in 2015, I was in the boardroom of Verizon for a completely different reason. And one of the senior executives of Verizon came up to me and said, congratulations, Jeff, you won. I said, I won. What did I win? It's like, on form. Behind door number two, here's this. No, no, no. <laughs> but he showed me these tombstone ads around the boardroom of Verizon. He said, look, in 2004, we bought Yahoo. We bought AOL. We, we bought Blue Jeans. And what you don't know, Jeff, is that you transformed Verizon from a telecom company to a data company. And frankly, if I did it to Verizon, chances are I also did it to AT&T. I did it to um, all the major operators around the world, ultimately. And then, and then just in January of this year, I, I, I was in a, at, a, at a major trade show, and I met these people that run these hosted data centers, these uh, hyper-connected data centers. And one of those people came up to me and said, congratulations and thank you. I said, what are you talking about? Well, since 2004, we've seen, we've seen hyper-growth in our data centers, because why? Because people want to communicate using voice over IP around the world, and the, and the demand for these connections have gone through the roof. So knowing that now, I, I know that the passing of the Pulver order very innocently has had a positive effect on moving the telecom industry to what's now a $2 trillion market, so you're welcome there. Um, and, and certainly, you know, during the days of Vaughn, I personally know about 120 companies that got acquired, vendors of mine, got acquired by some of our sponsors, about 120 that I tracked, and about 35 or 36 companies went public. And so I saw all that happen. And so, you know, if the Pulver ordered, imagine the pandemic, if if you were staying from staying at home, studying from home, working from home, and you couldn't video with people for free. If you'd imagine FaceTime, or if you're using Apple, where every time you went to a call with somebody, you have to pay extra. Yeah. Do you think the world will feel would feel as connected as it does today? Not Again, you're welcome yeah. because I can say that now in a smile because it did get passed. And in a very positive note, you know, the passing of the Pulver order provided guidance to a lot of governments around the world that looked to the FCC for regulatory clarity. And so, um, but it wasn't a short thing. It wasn't a short thing that was going to get passed. But the passing of that order created a, a, a landscape for opportunity, which still exists today. And so, when you look to the Devon or the, you know, the, the decentralized voice networks and video networks and data networks, really, and how to leverage it now, um, a lot of that investment would not have happened if the Pulver order didn't pass. And 
And now with newer minds coming to the market to rethink this, uh, things that were technically not possible before now become possible thanks to things like blockchain, where we could have immutable trust, where we could have uh, the ability for people to take assets and have other people invest in them or otherwise uh, sell them or de-risk situations. And it's just fascinating to see how people are thinking these days. Yeah, it, it is truly amazing. And seeing not only the opportunity and the vision, but it's starting to happen in real time. I think for all of us believers who are bought into this deep end narrative, um, it's, it's reassuring to say the least. One of uh, my questions for you specifically is you were involved with peer-to-peer -peer networks, you know, before Web3, before DUI and Deep In, and, and you're, you're really, I know that you're bought into what Web3 and blockchain can sort of bring to the table. So my question is, as VoIP really revolutionized telecommunications, how are you, how do you see the future of communications looking or going with this sort of DUI or Deep In enabled, uh, enabled world? Well, I, I think that the, the, the Deep In enabled world will provide facilities for people to communicate we have to be careful about the services we're offering, though, because as as Gen A grows up, uh, they're going to grow up into a world where the, not only does the Internet exist, but all their communication services they rely on are free. Right. So if you're a service, if you're a traditional service provider, you have to be thinking WTF, like what, we, what are we going to do? How are we going to make revenue? Because our, our customer base is disappearing and it's being replaced by Gen Z and Gen, and Gen Z and frankly, uh, Gen A, which uh, don't want to pay for things. Right. So how do we make communications compelling so that they pay for connectivity? And what types of services can we create that are network dependent, that are not local, so that people want to uh, use us? And so it's going to require a rethinking, a, a big global rethink in terms of what is communication and how do we create value and how do we get customers to be loyal and stay with us? And that's going to be an identity crisis that the phone companies haven't had to ha have not had in 150 years, and that's that's a big issue. So prior to that, I, I do think we'll see the ability for some asset investments to be, uh, um, well, if not if not off do off balance sheet financing, we certainly should see ways for people to be able to do de risk certain things. So that is to say, to turn bandwidth into an asset class, we should be able to take excess capacity and sell it off and at the same, sort of like the way that you see the energy markets evolving right now, the same way that you see uh, credits being offered uh, for people that, that very much want to do energy, um, that want to do green green things. We want to be able to make uh, green phone calls and stuff. You, you, you will be able to create energy efficient conversations. Uh, beware of generative AI, beware of the uh, AI is both your friend and could be something you need to protect with or against and you know, there's uh, you know, the FCC recently made it illegal for you to use a, uh, a a fake voice to make a robocall. But let me trust you: if you're doing robocalling, that's illegal to begin with. Right. Using a fake voice with a robocall doubly illegal. But do you think that if you're doing something with intentionally illegal, do you think it's going to stop someone? Maybe not. So, right. You know, I happen to be an advocate these days to say, "Gee, what if we make it so that every time you 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 call somebody, you have to pay a penny." So uh, to re that, that you have to pay a penny to the receiving party so that calling party pays. Because if you want to get rid of spam, and so like we grew, grew up in a world where with email, there's spam and we tolerate it. But we should not have to tolerate that on our communication networks. We want to find a way. And if a penny is not enough to stop and charge two pennies, charge a dollar, charge something. But we want to make it so that people can pick up the call and feel comfortable and confident who they're talking to. We need to bring, we need trust back. So but bringing blockchain into communications helps us bring trust. You know, you'll you'll see work being done by the GSMA with their DLT, their Distributed Ledger Technology Working Group, where they're bringing, uh, they're in fact using ledgers to uh, do settlement of, for mobile operators, and they're talking about doing a uh, stablecoin for settlement. So you're seeing that being driven being driven by the largest uh, trade association for mobile operators. So that should provide a le leading indication of what broadband communication providers can do. And um, while, and, and, and there's always gonna be wireless operators and you have the cable companies and the traditional telcos and then the upstarts. Ultimately, innovation has proven to be a wonderful way of changing the future. And I think that as the infrastructure gets more utilized and optimized and we could 
hopefully work with the next generation or the next next generation ahead to find ways to make this relevant for them because nobody wants to be in the quote dumb pipes business nobody wants to say gee just use my infrastructure pay me a flat fee people want to be involved in helping to make the things more compelling and so that's the challenge and you know, maybe there's advertising. Maybe there's advertising that's built into these products. Maybe it's going to be market. There's going to be something else, something different that we have today. I think, but um, just being able to have a conversation openly about this—that's an investment all to itself. Because for so long, everybody's been inside their verticals and haven't had that chance. And you know, uh, in April this year, I'm hosting an event uh, in Silicon Valley called uh, Vine Evolution. And one of the things that I'm doing at the at Vine Evolution, which is different than the old Vine, is uh, it's a multidisciplinary approach. And we're, so we're having, I have uh, sessions focused on bringing trust back. I have sessions focused on uh, on actually D-Vine, or because I, I can decentralize Vine because that's one of our trademarks, or at least were, and uh, as opposed to D-Pin. But we're looking at creating that value from using, by the, the cross-connecting blockchain with telecom, with 6G and AI and saying, what happens next? Right. And I, I and I think there's magic. And, you know, if people ever felt left out of a revolution because they were not there for the dot-com era or they're not there for the early days of blockchain, well, I, I think the future is in front of us and the opportunities to prosper are even greater now than ever before. But just hold on to the idea that just because nobody understands what you're doing doesn't mean you should do it. Some of the best ideas in the world were those that, from people that were just misunderstood. And you never know how close you are to being successful, but giving up, you give up everything. Right. But when you hold on to what you believe in and give it more energy, there's a large opportunity waiting for you to see your success happen. Oh, absolutely. It's an empowering message for a lot of innovators and builders in the space who believe that what they're doing is going to revolutionize the world and, and make crazy amounts of change and impacts. And uh, having someone who did it in the sort of the first generation and is bought into what's happening on this next generation. I think that that says a lot about the conviction. You talked a bit about some of some of the ways that, you know, Web3 and blockchain and Deepin are going to kind of revolutionize communication. You talked about bandwidth as an asset class. You talked about bringing trust back. Can you talk about some of the other applications that you're seeing that gets you really excited uh, with using these technologies? It's going to continue transforming communications for the better. Well, I, I think go back to trust. You know, if if uh, one of the issues we have is phone numbers, phone numbers in terms of well, whose number is it? And, and people don't realize that they don't mean that even though they are associated with a number, it might be their carrier that owns their no, the number, and not themselves. And that's a different conversation. But to say that. One of the things that voice over IP has helped, unfortunately, do is create no cost. The reason there's so much spam and robocalling is because it's free, because we've found ways to originate calls into the carrier networks that doesn't cost anything. Well, unfortunately, you're welcome for that, too. Uh, and uh, I didn't do that, but I didn't do anything to stop it either, because I didn't have the insight to realize that we had to ensure trust from the very beginning. Knowing that now, though, you know, so if, if there was a way to know that the endpoint calling me is a verified, validated endpoint, so I could trust them, then maybe I would answer my phone call. Similarly, like right now on apps, if you're talking to someone on WhatsApp or maybe using Telegram or Signal, most of the time you may answer a call coming to you because you trust that the person calling you from app to app is that person. Wait till that gets uh, compromised. Wait till. The apps are compromised by super apps that decide to fake it. What are you going to do then? So using blockchain as a means to discern and understand there's truth behind a number or an entity or a label that says it really is that, and you could certify that, that becomes invaluable. And and so if you've ever called into a call center, you know, not that long ago, when I called into a call center, let's say for Delta, I'd have to re-enter my phone number, even though they should know the call, calling ID of me. Right. I'd have to re-enter my phone number to, for them to know it was me, and I have to validate, verify, verify myself. And it's like, this is so frustrating. So having the ability to have an endpoint, a telephone device, an application be recognized. And then imagine once, you, once you're certified your phone, and you call to five different companies, wouldn't it be nice to only have to certify your phone once so that once your endpoint is verified, you now can do business across the board, call different consumer companies. They all trust that you are who you say you are. 
sort of like a KYC. I know your customer. Once you're validated, you have a stamp and now you're trusted. That changes commerce. That changes how we communicate. That changes how we do business. Right. And, and so phone numbers matter. And seeing how phone numbers and blockchain interoperate and interconnect and provide a way to then become triggers to drive more commerce, that only could be helpful. Um, you know, in real life, a number could be a text, right? It could be a label. It doesn't have to necessarily be a number format. If you're a developer, you you, re, you know that intuitively, but a lot of people don't realize that. And um, in the world of voice over IP, a long time ago, we came up with something called Enum. Enum is very much like DNS, but for phone numbers. And if you were to look at what Enum could do, uh, it's it could radically change our communication experience using the internet today. All you need to do is give Enum a try. Give e it's like all I am saying is give peace a chance. We'll give Enum a chance, and uh, magic ensues. And you, it's like for some people, they have to first experience it they, to feel it, and then they'll say, "Wow, this is cool." And so for me. I've been playing with these technologies for a long time uh, and I'm, uh, I'm still excited about the prospects of getting new blood into the industry and creating solutions for things which we, which we're blindsided by because we're not living, we don't, you know, every generation has a new way to communicate. They bring slang words into the local into our, in, you know, into the world right. and they communicate differently. And so I just really implore the service providers to, to hire the kids of their employees this summer and, and take a hard look at how people connect right now, because that's going to be a foreshadowing of what happens in the near future and the types of products and services they need to deliver on. Yeah. Well, you definitely don't need to convince me on, on bringing trust to uh, the phone number angle. I'm, I'm certainly, certainly with you on that. I'm, I'm curious as someone who's seen these sort of groundswells take place within the communication in industries in particular, how do you see the DY sort of deep in intersecting with this trad Y nature or this trad Y industry? Do you think that it's going to displace it? Do you think there's going to be some interoperability there? Um, if you were to speculate a little bit, where do you think the world's going in terms of that intersection? Well, it's it, what I've seen so far is despite people's hyperbole, it's never winner takes all. It, it just, but coexistence is good. And, and the intersection will, will most likely spur other ideas that create an opportunity for more market share growth uh, and, 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 and adaptability. And what you most likely will see is some medium and large companies starting to use it in a way that gets other sectors. You know, there's so many different sectors of business and all you need is one sector to start taking it seriously for other business groups to start using it. And so over time, the timeline might be very short for it to be widely widespread, but you just need to, need to start someplace and, and grow. Uh, does it take over and consume everything? I don't think so. I mean, if you look hard enough, you could still find people using fax machines. You could still find people using beepers, you know, for digital paging. If you look hard enough, yeah. In fact, if you look hard enough, you might even find people using telegraph, uh, similar to, uh, this, uh, where we send Morse code. There's still people who are out there that may use Morse code to send messages. Not the most efficient way, but you never know. So total complete overhaul, not as much as cooperation, um, co co-working, co-thinking. And by the way, when those worlds get together, ideas will open up and portals into innovation open up where with people who never thought about this now look at this as a real solution. And that opens up the possibilities to then grow geometrically uh, into something. I mean, a long time ago, I once said that blockchain was a four quadrillion dollar opportunity. Quadrillion is big effing number. Let me tell you that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but back in nineteen ninety, back in uh, twenty eighteen, you know, both Bitcoin and blockchain were two of the mis most overhyped, misunderstood technologies of the world much like every year we have another phenomena of something being misunderstood and overhyped whether it's nfts uh, for that matter maybe it's generative ai now okay. <clears throat> or just ai in general but there is some truth to that 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 we will see the, the technology shifts and you know why while a quadrillion is hard to imagine you know it, not that long ago the the crypto market cap wasn't a trillion now you know it grows geometrically and 
you know, telecom alone being two trillion is small, but it's pretty big. But then again, look at the market cap of of some of the companies that trade on the Nasdaq these days, and it's pretty big numbers. And so there's lots of wealth opportunities created. And if we can encourage people to challenge the status quo, because my well, the one my one takeaway more than anything is the power of one is much more powerful than the power of none. And that when you give yourself a chance to dream, dreams can be unbounded. And with the unboundedness of dreams, magic does happen. And as long as you allow yourself to see that future where not only is your dream captured, but the results of that dream being fulfilled happens, you can manifest almost anything. Yeah, it's so true. And, you, you know, if it wasn't for the people that take risks, the innovators, uh, none of this really would be possible. I, I'm also curious because you were in the early VoIP days, um, probably seen as an adversary for the traditional wireless companies who eventually adopted uh, a lot of. Yeah, I, I used to, I was friends with a with a CEO of Cellcom, and uh, he said, "My enemy, my friend." That's how he used to, inter- used to address me. <laughs> I'm I'm curious in this world where DY is starting to proliferate, um, and you know you touched on organizations like the GSMA starting to adopt what they don't call blockchain but DLT. It could, by the way, because for some of my friends. Hello, guys. You know, they know that the word blockchain is a trigger word and it triggers right. them because they think of all the bad things that crypto got into over the years. And so the GSMA, you know, they can't call it blockchain, they call it DLT, but right. we know what it really is. It's okay. We won't it's tell hush, hush, wink, wink, right? Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. How, how do you think they are, are looking at this deep in DY space? I, I don't, well, there's a, I think that every major telco, there are two things happening at the major, the 350 major phone companies around the world. Most of them have a Web3 strategy already, uh, but they, they may have washed it out when NFTs lost their value a couple of years ago, but they definitely were thinking Web3 back then. Um, and and they, they, def, they also have a, an AI strategy. And, you know, I, I do believe you'll find in the telco world, that during 2024, people will be assigned the role of CAIO, or that's Chief AI Officer. Hmm. Uh, I've seen a few uh, equivalent of of Chief Web3 officers. Uh, Telefonica, as an example, they have Web3, so they, they support Web3. Um, you know, in different flavors, people around Deutsche Telekom support Web3. Lots of projects, at least, are being tested and evaluated by some of the top operators around the world, but... What are they really thinking? You know, there are three words that have to be in their mind or behind on their board, which is called fear, greed, and disruption. Now, when I hear those three words together, I smile because fear, greed, and disruption by themselves are pretty dark words, but together they represent green opportunities. They represent an opportunity to prosper because if, if, an, if a new innovation <coughs> is creating fear, that means an incumbent is being disrupted, Right. And greed, because these incumbents, they don't want to give up market share. They don't want to give up valuation. So the upstarts make money. And disruption, well, maybe that's why a company gets acquired. And and, and the thing is, when one of the signs of disruption is when incumbents go to their lobbyists and go to their telecom attorneys, and they find laws written 100 years ago as a way to stop the impending doom. And a lot of time these days, they can't stop that innovation. So they have to adopt it. So the smarter telcos, they're doing Web3 right now. They're doing blockchain um, and they're doing AI. And I think that what you won't see, what you, where you're going to see conversations about how AI and how Web3 platforms inside communication companies will redefine the customer experience, both from a consumer as much as an advertiser and how we could do things that we never could do before and how those worlds will interconnect. And and, and that gets interesting. And so uh, let's just say that nobody wants to be fired for not having a strategy. So my hope is of the major tier one operators around the world, everybody has a Web3 strategy in place. Not everybody has executed upon it. Unfortunately, due to market timings, Back in let's say twenty, uh, I don't know, uh, twenty uh, twenty one, maybe you know, twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty one, when everyone started learning how to spell NFT, 
and people started to try to understand the difference between fungible and non-fungible tokens. All right, what's a token? What's a security token? What's this? Like, ah, so, so people, that got so complicated. So we look past all that. So can we use NFTs uh, to transfer value? Sure. Are, are we seeing NFTs as a way to sell eSIMs? Absolutely. Are we seeing, so there's lots of initials, lots of vocabulary, but at the end of the day, when you bring technologists together with disruptive technology, most of us will smile and we'll say, yay, this is cool. This is not boring. This is not what we're used to doing. These are new innovative opportunities to do provisioning and to embrace a brave new world. And let's find ways to make money together. Let's yeah. find ways to transfer knowledge so that it's not you against me, but it's we working together to create positive change and then maybe then sell those solutions to other operators around the world whose customers will also benefit from it. Because while the world is global, people service local communities. And so maybe do a test case in one part of the world, see how it works, and then bring it forth into another part of the world to see where that works. And so at the end of the day, my hope is that due to the evolution of these technologies, more people will get to communicate more often with loved ones. My hope is that people will find ways to transfer value and deliver services which the next generation really wants so that people are always encouraged to communicate. Because at the very end of the day, life is short. And, you know, as much as I tell friends, don't hold off t saying I love you to someone because you just never know, that, you know, what the last time you may see someone is. Don't wait till someone passes away to say, damn it, I really love that person. Why didn't I say something? You know, don't hold back on your dreams because your dreams may pass you by. And so now is a time to put your feet down and dream big and let and find people to help you support those dreams. And if those supporters are not there, know that you're there and don't give up on yourself. Yeah, it's such a great message, uh, especially from someone who's been there, done that. Uh, and and I, I think anybody listening that's interested in building can really appreciate that. Uh, you know, you talked about a couple use cases that just weren't possible before Web3 and sort of this deep in narrative, bringing trust back these these new asset classes. A as an innovator yourself, are there specific innovations that you've seen within this DY deep in space that personally gets you excited? Well, I mean, there's the things that get me excited, there are also things that get me a little uh, scared. I mean, the uh, it's it's like uh, back in '96, I heard the 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 first first time I ever heard the phrase uh, "snake oil salesman," <laughs> and and we have to be careful about the over excitement or over hyping things because if we over promise and under deliver, nobody's happy. Um, I mean, I, I really liked I you know I became a fan of Giant Protocol, for example. Not only because of, I like their story about selling bandwidth as an asset class, because the backstory is is the fact that behind the scenes they use the NFT protocol data structure as a way to sell eSIMs, and that's just genius. And right. the way that 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 Saruchi is able to work with operators and move bandwidth like that that is kind of cool to me. And and I look at other examples of being able to offset or balance out uh, bandwidth and balance out other other connectivity, that makes sense. But like when I look at like like and you know I'm sorry I don't mean to pick on any companies because I don't do that. I you know I've been fortunate to be able to invest in over 440 startups in my life, maybe and start a bunch of companies. But like when when I see like a deep in company being hyped out which deals with pets. All I'm thinking, gee, why does the government want to start tracking me? Because if they're going to track the location of the pets, maybe they're looking to secretly track the location of their pet owners. Right. And, what is, and who's going to own that data? And what's going to happen? Like, oh no. So, so I don't want to go there because there's like there's a there's from a generational perspective, privacy either doesn't exist or people want to protect it, and and it and it's hard to understand. But but the other hand, you know. If you've ever helped, my mom had Alzheimer's, and and while she never got lost living leaving the house, sometimes she, I felt like she was lost in the house, at least not knowing where she was or forgot about stuff. And you know, if you've ever dealt with loved ones that that have a hard time knowing where they are, they do have tracking devices. And so, if we could use our Web three technologies to val validate, verify who our loved ones are, and and help make sure that they're safe. <clears throat> and by the way, same thing for pets, but just let's not be so spooky. Uh, and, and find ways to trust that the lots of other community services, which may seem obvious to you, but don't exist right now, can come into existence. And the world's a big place. And so 
you know, can we get super excited about things that do the obvious? Absolutely. You know, right now we, we, we're we're about, we're living in the pre pre drone era. Right now we see drones because we can use them to take great aerial photographs. Wait till we start seeing drones come at scale when we have package deliveries all the time where no matter what neighborhood you are in America, a drone's going to come in and deliver because it's cheaper and more efficient for the company you ordered from to do a drone delivery than, than, send, a, than send a truck out during rush hour because of all the emissions. So that because we're talking about carbon neutral worlds where we were able to do savings like that. And so guess what? that drone network's probably being navigated and managed by blockchain somewhere. Because we want to prove that we want to have, uh, uh, we, we want to look at the the, uh, the chain of command and make sure that something that was purchased ultimately was delivered and is validated and verified on a chain because that's probably what will happen. So you're going to see lots of blockchains going into every different sector as the world evolves. And remember, we're pre-drone right now. Uh, if you've ever seen the Jetsons TV, uh, Jetsons uh, cartoons, you know that we're not living in a world yet where your uh, spacecraft can fold into a, into a suitcase just yet, but we're getting closer to some of those things becoming real. And a lot of the stuff that, that was on cartoon when I was growing up has become real life from invasive uh, videos from bosses coming in and looking to looking at where you're living to, you know, the ability to have a lot of these kinds, it's just all has happened. So drones are, or drones are next. Um, and and let's face it, uh, you probably haven't you may I don't know if you ever have you probably haven't experienced what it feels like to take out a cassette tape and rewind it using a pencil. I have, <laughs> and, and and those are experiences which you know, maybe did change me, but that's sort of an analog versus the digital world that we're now in. And you know, so there's there's going to be remnants all around us. And uh, you know, as long as we remember that not every not, not every not every change goes as fast or, or as good as we want it to. Uh, standardization matters. You know, there was a big beta versus VHS issue years ago with videotape. And you may say, what's videotape? But <laughs> it does, and there's what's a VCR, but which would be a video, uh, video a VHS player. And, and so, but the thing is, standards matter. So when you evolve technologies, having global buy-in on the approach helps bring solutions to scale. And that's something which we should just keep in mind that interoperability is good, standards are good and business partners are good and so while we will work alone if we could find ways to work together and and get um people to to communicate and get to know each other one of the most powerful assets you could ever have is your own network and i'm not talking about physical network i'm talking about a people network and being able to have people around you to help support what you do uh, appreciate the wow of what you're looking to do and then help you connect the dots to help you get to the next frontier because you know we're all living on a frontier of something and uh and pioneering something and a lot of the best innovations may not have maybe they're still stuck in your head but i would encourage you and encourage the people listening to your podcast to give yourself a chance if you see an idea take it and and run with that and uh if someone says no to you it just means they don't understand you it doesn't mean you have a bad idea uh real quickly i'll just mention that Years ago, for the few years I worked on Wall Street, um, I had in it back in 1994. I had an idea for web-based email, and I shared this with a few of my of my peers, and they told me it was a stupid idea. So I, I did not go after that. And then a few months later, I had an idea to do online mortgage brokering because I needed to get a mortgage for my house, for a new house. And people said oh, that was a stupid idea. <laughs> and what I realized was I had needed to find new friends. Yeah. The people I was talking to didn't get me. It didn't mean that my ideas were bad. I just had to find people that either, and, and why, by the way, why would I outsource my future to strangers? You know, the, why should I let these people be my personal GPS to guide me when I should just have the strength to do it myself? And the, the answer was because I didn't know. And now I know that, <clears throat> excuse me, while I do like to, ask for advice. I also do things just feeling the energy and just following the flow of where things go. So uh, if you're if you're an innovator, innovate and be disrupt positively disruptive because uh, the future is waiting for you. Yeah, it's such a good message and, and one we like to continue sharing on the podcast. Well, God, Jeff, we've covered so many different topics uh, covering the history of, of voice over IP. What's going well, on? In, in this... a very short time, and I do want to give out, to, you know, a shout out to the thousands and thousands of people that helped make that history happen because uh, 
it, it's, it's a collective work, not just one person's work, but lots of people contributed to that future that we're all living in now. Yeah, yeah, and, and kudos, hats off to all of those sort of unnamed participants and, and innovators. We, we definitely, we definitely thank them. Was there anything else you wanted to share before we get a chance to wrap up uh, about stuff you're working on or, or things that you're excited about? I really, I'm excited about. The, so what excites me about DPIN is the fact that that uh, old school networks are being looked at again. That the decentralization of things that are centralized are worthwhile convers are worthwhile conversations to have. There will be people who don't agree, which is good. I mean, if everyone agreed to everything, life would be boring. And so, we could have good conversations. We could explore stuff and. You know, if I were to put a plug in for anything, I, I happen to be in 2024, I'm working on a series of events where it's people focused, where I, I bring people together, uh, small events, you know, I'm talking about like 100 person events and larger events. And if you happen to go to pulver.com and see an event coming up, uh, consider joining if you're interested in the future. Uh, friends of mine have certainly seen that future as much as I have, and I, I enjoy bringing friends together, new and old to uh to see what the what opportunities exist so thank you for having me as your guest it's really nice to get to know you yeah no absolutely it's it's been a fun conversation and uh a quick plug you are doing an event in april uh and i believe we're going to be having a fun conversation speaking about deep in you would mentioned that we could possibly give away some tickets for for listeners of the podcast uh that's for, right for... if you're listening to this podcast and it's and it's uh today we're if you if you get to be the event itself is April uh, 10th and 11th. If you contact me uh, before April 7th, my email is jeff at pulver.com. We have four tickets to give to your listeners. So if you email jeff at pulver.com and you reference this podcast before April 7th, uh, 2024, happy to have you as a guest at, uh, at Vine Evolution. Well, we're excited and we appreciate that. We're going to be sure to share that with all of our listeners. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm positive there will be some folks very interested to to come and show up. So where else can listeners stay up to date with what you're working on? You've got your website. Are there any other places that you're active that people should go find you? Uh, they can find me on LinkedIn. It's a, if you could find Jeff Pulver on LinkedIn, uh, that's probably the, you know, I used to, I was an early investor in Twitter. I used to always put things on Twitter, but now it's X and that's a little different world for me right now. But uh, I still have my, my, tw my X account, but, LinkedIn is is primary, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm on all these other networks, but 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 probably LinkedIn is for me is the easiest way to find me. Although, yes, you can find me on Telegram. Just look up my name. But anyway, <laughs> that's that's good. We'll, we'll plug that too for for folks if they want to get in contact with you. Awesome, that's Jeff. Well, hey, we that's really true. appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, we'll be sure to link all of that information down below. If you're interested in going to the event, definitely give Jeff an email. Reference the podcast. Uh, I can assure you it will be well worth your time. There'll be a lot of great folks there. So Jeff, I want to thank you again. We'll wrap it up here, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you on the next one.